Hi there, hello. Welcome back. And uh, I'm again, Daniel Kirsch. Hair's pretty wild today. Um, so I uh, just wanna say hello and, and welcome you to this uh, lecture about policy. Everybody's favorite thing. You know, there are some textbooks that actually are printed and uh, their edition, we have the essentials edition of our textbook. But some textbooks actually have one without policy chapters because Students tend to not like it so much, and teachers then don't really like teaching it either. Um, but I'm going to try to keep it simple. It's going to be a little long, but it'll be simple. I think we're, we're going to only have about 25 minutes anyway. So here we go. Um, so we're going to be talking mostly about economic and social policy directed by the U.S. government. And so one thing I want to do is put into some context what it is the federal government does. Uh, and what their uh, relationship is with the American public. So for one thing, let's talk about the federal budget and why they spend uh, on what they do and what are some of the differences between what the federal government does and what some other agencies do. So the first thing is there are two types of economic policy you should know about. Let's see, first, fiscal policy. Uh, it's simple, it's just the amount of money that the government collects uh, and spends every year. So when we talk about fiscal policy, we're talking about the IRS. Uh, what they collect in, tox in taxes, and we're talking about the annual budget process in Congress. And we're talking about the Cabinet, uh, Department of the Interior, Department of Transportation, uh, building new roads and bridges, spending money to do that. Just the government spending money. It's the check that comes from the Treasury, all this fiscal policy. Uh, if the government's going to write a check to anyone, whether they're going to spend millions or trillions of dollars every year in one policy or another, uh, together, the federal government is spending on all those priorities about $5 trillion annually. Um, so I just want to give kind of a more political take, though, uh, rather than economic on the history of what we're talking about here. Uh, to that end, let me offer a non-economic characterization of where we stand in the modern era. Uh, a lot of the value that it's held today by U.S. money, or really all money, uh, is based on not metal uh, like, like gold uh, or silver, but on confidence. Uh, and this, really change, this change really happened in the early 20th century. And during that time period, uh, it was thought, you know, this is ridiculous. We have the most powerful economy in the world at that point, still do. Uh, theoretically, you should be able to... Um, you would still have to be able to exchange a paper dollar for some kind of metal uh, that you could find or not find in the ground somewhere. Um, why don't we just base it on the confidence in our economy and, and uh, since we have a lot of that instead of a lot of metal, a lot of silver. So they did that and through the decades and lots of decades of debate of course, the Federal Reserve System now just guarantees and the federal government also guarantees every Federal Reserve note, uh, every dollar bill, every five dollar bill, every hundred dollar bill, all of them. So the Federal Reserve System is governed by a board of governors, and not to get into this too much, but essentially the head of the Federal Reserve Committee, the Open Market Committee, is appointed by the U.S. President. Uh, they have a term of four years. And even though that person is appointed by the President, they are considered an independent actor uh, in law, and they're not accountable to the President. There's no impeachment process. They're not, strictly speaking, a federal employee. The Federal Reserve is essentially funded by banks. Uh, they're largely run kind of for banks uh, because they're a lender of last resort to large banks. And their function is basically governing the entire economy in a way that is beneficial to the entire economy, all the people in it. So the chair of the Federal Reserve has one especially prominent and important tool to do this, and this tool is the interest rate. Okay. So economic policy and monetary policy, monetary supply, is controlled really by this interest rate. Uh, and they determine the interest rate that is used to borrow money. So the Federal Reserve lends to large banks, large commercial and investment banks in the US. And they, so by doing that, setting the interest rate um, determines the amount of money in circulation because it gives either an incentive to borrow money by lowering the interest rate, or it gives an incentive to slow down by, on borrowing money by those commercial and investment banks by raising the interest rate. So if those commercial and investment banks have then an incentive to borrow money where, it's, where the money is cheap, um, you know, it's lower, lower rate of, of interest that they have to pay, uh, 
uh, it means they will in turn lower their own interest rates to smaller banks so that those smaller banks then can then borrow from them and large corporations can borrow from them and, and so on and so on. And so smaller banks will have an incentive to loan more money to others to lower their interest. So consumers and small businesses will see that as an opportunity financially to borrow money from that small bank at a low interest rate. So if they raise the interest rate, the Fed, that is, raises the interest rate, that means there's going to be a slowing effect on the money supply. But if they lower it, that means there's more money in circulation. And if they raise it, there's less. And it's really the Federal Reserve System's job to not only make sure there's enough money in circulation or not enough money in circulation to make sure inflation uh, doesn't get out of hand. So inflation is this idea that if you simply just print money all the time, uh, eventually the money will become worthless. Okay, like, like Germany in the 20s, you know, where people passing around wheelbarrows full of money to buy a loaf of bread is kind of how it's usually how it's expressed. But, um, but that's not usually what happens, and uh, in inflation, that's kind of the, the twin um, policy objectives that the Federal Reserve System has, is to keep inflation low while uh, keeping the economy going at a high growth rate. So that's not always an easy thing to do, uh, as well as kind of being asked to balance unemployment and several other factors as well. Um, so the Federal Reserve Chair can get a lot of credit or a lot of blame, depending on how the economy is going. It's not always really their fault. Um, you know, they're simply trying to um, steer between these two policy objectives that aren't always reconcilable. So, in any event, the, the other thing we need to talk about, um, let's, more, let's talk more about fiscal policy. So monetary policy is just that. Uh, is trying to keep the economy going, make sure there's enough money in the economy, but also make sure that the money is worth something. Um, so, so let's talk more about fiscal policy, uh, a little about budget making and the, the welfare state in the U.S. Uh, the welfare state in the U.S. is really very paltry uh, comparison to other developed countries. Uh, the welfare state as we know it today, uh, as well as Social Security as we know it, was originally called old age insurance, uh, old age insurance in the 1930s. Uh, today it's called old age survivors and disability insurance, OASDI. And it was run by an agency and still is called the Social Security Administration. So the program is called Social Security by most people, even though it's officially OAI or OASDI. Uh, but we'll come back to how there's, a, there's also another uh, program called unemployment insurance that guarantees uh, some income for people who are out of work through no fault of their own, through a layoff, not through firing. So those are two things that happened in the 1930s uh, as part of the Franklin Roosevelt administration during the New Deal was uh, as part of his alphabet soup of new agencies. One of them was OAI, Old Age Insurance, and another one was un UI or Unemployment Insurance. Uh, and there's another one called AFDC, uh, or Americans, uh, sorry, Aid to Families with Dependent Children. Uh, and today that's been replaced. Uh, they use what we used to call welfare, uh, but that ended in 1996. It was the guarantee of federal aid to impoverished people, and of which there is no longer a guarantee. Today it's been replaced by another program called Temporary Aid to Needy Families, and that has a limit of two years at a time. So even if you are impoverished, uh, your, your benefits are cut off. Uh, and there is one thing I want to tell you about in terms of Social Security is the way it does work. Uh, it's a system called payroll taxes, and they've always been operated uh, by this idea that payroll taxes that are literally just from the paycheck that you receive for your wages on either a weekly or bi-weekly or monthly basis. Uh, the revenue from workers' paychecks are able to pay the obligations to the program, and Social Security has uh, all the current retirees uh, in it, and they draw money from the so-called Social Security Trust Fund, which is just a fiction. So it's, it's, it's an accounting and it's a political fiction, because it's not as if you pay money like it goes into a giant savings account um, and you get all the money back you work for. If it worked that way, hardly anyone would get paid by Social Security. Uh, and would also, even if you did get paid, inflation would be such an enemy that you probably would have a lot less than you thought you did. Uh, and burn through most of your savings in the first couple of years. But instead, Social Security, the way it works is during your whole life, 
you get a certain amount of credit uh, in, in terms of your investment in the fund by the taxes you've paid into it, the number of years you've worked. It's all a formula. It's not just a simple, you know, dollar in, dollar out kind of thing. Uh, for example, I just happened to have access to one average worker social security statement recently. Um, may or may not be my own. Uh, then as someone who has been paying social security for about 25 years, uh, it gives you a statement of how much you were, you were, um, you earned that year. And so if you go, actually, if you want to do this, you could go, if you've even been working for a couple of years, uh, you could go to ssa.gov. Uh, or my SSA.gov, uh, Social Security Administration.gov. If you're a U.S. citizen, as long as you've had at least one job, you have a Social Security number and you have you have access to it. So with every paycheck you earn, you pay 6.25 percent of that paycheck uh, into Social Security. And that's a big amount, and it's a percent you know for your whole life. That's the way it works. Um, they actually collect more than that, though. Not just that 6.25 percent of your paycheck. They collect twice as much as that because let's say you worked at a job and they pay you like a hundred dollars a week follow me so far so they pay you get a job a hundred dollars a week sometimes you're able to get a ten dollars an hour with a part-time job and not california but another state that doesn't have a minimum wage as high as ours and and you got uh, 10 hours a week so out of that hundred dollars you paid six dollars and 25 cents then your employer has to match whatever that percentage yields uh, and that comes out to. So for our purposes, they have to match $6.25. So that doesn't come out of your paycheck. Um, it comes out of their their funds. So you still end up with, what, $93.75 after that, after all is said and done from Social Security taxes anyway. Um, but they still have to pay that additional six twenty five. dollars So it's like you get an effective tax rate from of 12.5% of wages from all workers, but workers are only paying half of that. Employers are paying the other half. Let's see. So that's how Social Security works. Uh, that's the basic formula. And some say that it's, uh, you know, going to go bankrupt. Uh, that's not really um, necessarily true. Uh, and and uh, it can be, there's a lot of very creative things that Congress could do to make sure that Social Security benefits continue. Uh, and one thing the U.S. can actually um, uh, can pay out of the general fund or they can cut benefits. They can raise the, the number of they can raise the amount of money that is taxed. And that's that's a story for another time. Um, but the general fund itself, let's talk more generally about the budget. Uh, the budget itself this year, uh, I looked it up recently, is going to be about six trillion dollars. Um, but the U.S. is only taking in about $3 trillion in taxes. So where are they getting the rest of the money? Because it's supposed to be taxpayer dollars is, is what we say, right? Um, how do they borrow more money? They just borrow money from banks. Uh, maybe U.S. banks, maybe Chinese banks, maybe Japanese banks, maybe European banks. Uh, any banks around the world they can borrow money from. Uh, or whoever is willing to buy the debt. Uh, they don't have to borrow money from banks. Like anyone who has enough money to buy a lot of, uh, you know, savings bonds, those, that's debt. Um, and it's an agreement that the federal government is going to pay you back and they have, you know, a stellar credit rating. So you're going to get your money back, but it's a question of how much of that cash uh, does the U.S. have to spend. Um, so that's when those banks, they buy treasury bills, they buy like a savings bond. Anyway. So they're buying a guarantee that the U.S. government will pay them back with interest when that savings bond is due. Treasury notes is also what they're called. T-bills, treasury notes, savings bonds, debt, government debt, all the same thing. Uh, they do all of that just because there's a deficit every year. Uh, there's a deficit this year, massive one, um, probably more massive because of the coronavirus and the ensuing kind of economic crisis. But now let's talk about um, two other very large programs in addition to Social Security. Because of that $6 trillion, uh, a huge percentage of it, around 20% is Social Security. But another 20 or 30% is, is uh, health care spending. So that's Medicare and Medicaid combined. Uh, let's talk about both of them. And let's, let's make sure that we keep them straight. Because I think a lot of people, when first talking about this issue, can never seem to keep straight what's Medicare and what's Medicaid. Um, 
It was, it's a social program that started really during the Johnson administration. We talked about in the post-World War II era for the U.S. Uh, kind of decided in the labor market, large employers, especially ones like car companies negotiating with their labor unions like the United Auto Workers, uh, who essentially said we're going to guarantee health care to workers at our plants because that's what we're going to negotiate in terms of our contracts and retain good workers. We're going to provide them generous benefit packages. We're going to give them health care and benefits, pensions, so that when um, the largest employment you know, deals were struck uh, with, with their lawyers uh, were kind of there, then uh, they were able to set a, a precedent for the entire market. So the U.S. tax code has kind of upheld that grand bargain that's often called that. Uh, what we're saying is the U.S. had the economic engine to do all of that, uh, and the United Auto Workers were, were a good kind of test case. Uh, it wasn't long before the 1950s, just about every job in the U.S. had, uh, had a full health care benefit. Um, there were also part-time, there weren't a lot of part-time jobs. You could still get a full health care package for a part-time job and a pension, something like Social Security once you're retired. But this really went away in a big way. Over the last 30 years or so, it's come down to only about 7% of employers or employees, I think, have some kind of package that's available to employees that gives a guaranteed benefit pension. So now it's all uh, individual savings accounts, 401ks that you can invest. But then if you lose it all in the stock market, you're out of luck. So there's really no safety net. It's more of a savings program for individuals. Uh, and, and really it's, it's going to be at less of a return uh, than Social Security would be. So Medicare is very similar um, to Social Security, the way it's funded. It's um, through payroll taxes, but at a much lower rate. Uh, they get like a, it's like a percent and a half uh, rather than 6.25 percent. 62 is, I believe, the earliest time you can opt in unless you're disabled. Um, so according to kind of the American social contract, they're entitled where the word entitlement comes from. They're, they're Legally, they're entitled to a certain benefit when they retire. Uh, but it doesn't cover everything. There are several programs within Medicare that I don't pretend to understand at this point. But, you know, I guess I have a couple of years before I have to figure it out for myself. But you can purchase other insurance to supplement your Medicare. And most people do to a certain degree. Medicaid is very different. Uh, Medicaid is the program for uh, poor and low-income folks, and it's California. It's called Medi-Cal. Uh, and when, when I moved here in 2016, uh, I discovered that about 40% of Californians, uh, and more than that in some counties in the Central Valley, are actually funded um, in terms of their health insurance through Medi-Cal. It's administered by the states, but that's what it's called here. So Medicare, I'm sorry, Medicaid, Medi-Cal, same thing for the poor and low income, Medicare for seniors and the disabled. Um, so let's see. So what you should know about modern health care is that it's not a radical change from what existed earlier. Uh, this idea that uh, Obamacare changed things is simply not true. Um, there were 44 million Americans uninsured at that point, and Obamacare was a bill to try to alleviate that. The bill uh, in 2010 was a combination of three things. Uh, it's supposed to be mandating that people buy health care, they provide a subsidy uh, if people can't afford to buy it, uh, and also allowing people to be covered despite their pre-existing conditions. And finally, for people to be allowed to stay in their parents' health insurance until they're 26. So it was this idea that you were, if you were going to be making insurance carriers cover people they didn't want to cover pre-existing, um, but the incentive was that you were going to provide to them millions of new customers, uh, and you were going to expand the insurance pool, and that would eventually bring costs down. That's the idea. Um, the majority of states, uh, because it was run through, they made it a state mandate, which is probably a mistake. Uh, the majority of states were run by opponents um, of President Obama, Republicans, and they opted not to take the additional Medicaid money uh, to be able to implement the Obamacare program. So I would say there's, there's this unfortunate political football between Democrat, Democrats and Republicans, because all that really did was, all it really did was injure the confidence that American people had in any sort of healthcare system because the Obamacare system fundamentally really changed nothing. Uh, just kind of mandated that people join the existing system through a couple of patches. So all these other countries that have healthcare systems, all these other industrialized democracies, uh, the U.S. is not really at all comparable to them. It's become so fragmented that that's probably the popularity of ideas like Medicare for all among Republicans and Democrats, at least people, not politicians. But um, but the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is tax policy and budgets. 
and um, tax policy. Uh, during World War II, uh, it taxed the richest Americans at a rate of about 94%, and for decades it was lowered to about 70% until the 1980s, uh, when Reagan and Bush raised it from 70 to 28 or 30%. So that was called progressive taxation. So the more money you make, the higher, the much higher rate of tax you have to pay. Um, but this applied to, you know, millionaires and things. Uh, and and uh, it eliminates, this is a progression of, of how high taxes were uh, to how low they become for the wealthiest individual. Now they didn't pay this whole 94%. It was sort of a starting point. Uh, they did have a lot of deductions they were allowed. But there was this acknowledgement that those who had a lot of wealth were really expected to pay a lot more towards the American social welfare state because they were getting so much out of the workers. But today it's become a lot more couched in notions of fairness and justice that everyone somehow gets a very similar rate. And so the idea of progressive taxation, uh, you know, the more you have the bigger chunk of your wealth you're supposed to pay, has not really been maintained in terms of the political conversation. Um, so, so Trump's tax cut bill seems to be the apotheosis of that, that at this point, a tax, it was a tax cut in 2017 that was supported by his Republican um, majority in the House and Senate. But um, it ended up that a lot of um, lower income and middle income folks ended up paying more in taxes. And the wealthier uh, folks were, and corporations were benefited severely from it, even though um, it was called a tax cut for them. And it was the, called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, the vast majority of people who it affected ended up paying more. So I wanna, what I want to leave you with is that um, the policy process itself uh, should be evaluated this way. Uh, not only as good as how well it's serving people, but also just how, you know, how well you're able to study it through the policy process. So if it's done a really decent job, then um, that's good. But if uh, certainly there's a lot of complicating factors uh, as to whether a policy is working, um, but I'm not going to really going to be getting into education, transportation, immigration. Those are all domestic policies. But I want to look at you to look at at least one example of the policy process. It's simply a framework for understanding how policies are created. And policies are just a $10 word for law or anything that the government does. And agenda setting is at the beginning of that. And that's just what issues are we going to talk about? And how are we going to talk about them? And usually that's Congress and the president and and formulation is the next step in that. It's when they start to come up with ideas for bills about what to do uh, and decision making is deciding which one we're actually going to vote on and then voting in the affirmative and creating a new law is implementation and that's when executive branch administers a new law uh, and when they when those laws go out for evaluation by not only uh, policymakers like Congress and the president but also the media and the people and that becomes the, the basis for the new policy agenda. What else are we gonna talk about? What new policies are we gonna talk about? And how are we gonna formulate them and make decisions about them before they're implemented? So that's how we talk about all of policy, whether it's transportation, immigration, education, uh, healthcare, defense, all of it is all, the policy process is a pretty, um, I didn't draw it well up here, but it's in your book. Uh, it's a five step process and and it's called a cycle because evaluation is supposed to feed back into uh, agenda setting. And it's not a perfect model, but it basically shows you what uh, ideally looking at a policy and studying it is supposed to look like. So that's all from me. Uh, and thanks for, for watching this. And I will uh, talk to you in class if you have questions about policy at all or any of the policies I mentioned, like Social Security, Federal Reserve process, or the policy process. Uh, I imagine you have a few, but uh, please let me know and I will talk to you uh, in class. Thanks very much.